Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to this week's episode of the MotorOne.com podcast. There was a time when station wagons were thick on the ground across the country. Times have changed, though, and now crossovers are the most popular form of family transportation. The some automakers, though, continue to make wagons, and we salute them. This week, Audi unveiled the RS6 Avant, a nearly 600 horsepower all-wheel drive super wagon that will, for the first time ever, be sold in the U.S., We're going to talk about it on today's episode, along with why station wagons have fallen out of favor and which ones are our favorite of all time. Joining me this week is MotorOne.com writer Chris Bruce. How are you, Chris? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Sure. Also with us is writer Christopher Smith. How are you doing, Chris? I'm wonderful. This is going to be hard since I have two Chris's on the show, so maybe Just I'll call last one names. Of, That's what, it, what we do in Slack. Uh, all right. Bruce, Bruce and Smith or CB and CS, I'll, I'll get your attention one way or another. We'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll figure it out. So this episode kicks off with the debut of the 2019 Audi RS6 Avant. And let me give um, some history about this car, but also uh, some specs of what the new one uh, has to offer. So Audi has offered uh, RS versions of the A6 uh, for a long time. Uh, the U.S. even got the sedan versions of the RS6 a couple times, uh, which were some of my favorite cars of all time. Uh, but we've never had the RS6 Avant, and the Avant version is, of course, the wagon. So this is the first time we're getting the RS6 Avant, and they debuted this car just this week. It will come with a twin-turbo 4.0-liter V8, makes 591 horsepower and 590 pound-feet of torque, Uh, will do 0 to 60 in 3.6 seconds. It will have a top speed of 155 miles per hour as standard, although you can buy a dynamic package that raises that to 174 miles per hour, or you can buy a dynamic package plus that raises it all the way up to 190 miles per hour, which is incredible for a station wagon. Um, It'll also come with a new version of Audi's virtual cockpit, and I've seen this gauge display, and it looks amazing as Audi's digital displays uh, tend to. Also, it's really, really cool LED lights uh, I've seen videos of. They do this really neat light show with the headlights uh, when you turn the car on. All around, an extremely impressive vehicle. I haven't even mentioned what it looks like, and it looks stunning. I think that's what strikes me most about it is it looks like a a very burly wagon. I mean, really wide fender flares. In addition to the very large Audi grille that all Audis have, it has these incredibly large air intakes flanking that grille. That looks sinister. Um, just a gorgeous, gorgeous wagon. Um, so this just really just debuted um, a day or so ago. Chris Bruce, wh- what do you think? How did how did the the debut hit you? Was it exciting to see not only uh, this wagon debut, but for the first time ever, not just debut for Europeans, but for also us in North America as well? Yeah, it, it's super exciting that it's no longer forbidden fruit that, you know, we've we've gotten the RS6 before, like you've said, but never in wagon form. It's nice that this thing is finally here and that you can finally show it to people who maybe aren't car fans and say, this is the only car you need. If you want to take the kids to soccer practice, load them in the back. If you want to, you know, go do triple digit speeds down the Autobahn. Also, 100% possible and easy. I'm I'm happy it's here. I probably will never be able to afford one, but hey, if I see one on the road, it'll still make me happy. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because in terms of like when you think about cars, usually they're they're good at one thing or good at two things and, and bad at a few others. You look at a wagon and a performance wagon in particular, and what are you missing out on? You've got an incre- you've got a world class performance car. You've got the capability to haul around more stuff. You know, it's not a seven passenger vehicle by any means, but it fits five very comfortably and a whole bunch of stuff behind them. To me, it seems like the the best of all worlds in such a great marriage of them all. And again, the sinister, awesome, gorgeous looks of it. They just did such a good job with the styling. Uh, what about you, Smith? What do you think? You know, I did an article just earlier today that uh, was talking about um, Audi's RS6 designer. Uh, hopefully I get his name right. Francesco D'Amour, where he referenced basically Star Wars and Darth Vader and said this time around the uh, the idea behind the RS6. It's always been kind of this this hero vehicle. Now we want to make it a little more sinister. So describing the looks, this thing is 
sinister. I mean, Audis have always been fairly understated in their styling, right? And not only understated, but kind of um, happy. No, I, I would say like their faces were kind of like either neutral or, or like happy. This one has angry eyes. It, 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 yeah, the front end looks like Darth Vader. It's, it looks like it's going to whip out a lightsaber and cut your head off. It's very, I mean, I won't say uncharacteristic, but it's certainly a different direction um, than what we've seen on past wagons from Audi. And I typically don't like Audi's style. Um, I'm not a huge fan of that big grill really on anything. I love this car. For some reason, just th that big chiseled chin, those side intakes, and that big grill in the middle, it works on this car. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's got a bespoke hood. Um, that's the, that's uh, specific for the RS6 um, on, on the Avant. Uh, it's got the fenders that are flared out a little bit more. And yeah, with the, the Dynamic Plus package or whatever, 190 miles an hour, 0 to 60 and 3.6. I wish I had 100 grand because, you know, that's uh, we don't know pricing yet, but, you know, that's what it's going to cost. Oh, it's going to be. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a six figure. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I actually I don't want to say I'm not a fan of Audi design. I think Audis look fine. Uh, they look kind of classically handsome. I'm, I'm not a fan of how slow Audi design evolves. It's just they 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 very much rehash the same thing, the same aesthetic over and over again. And sharpen a crease here around it the next time you know uh but this one yeah this one takes a step out of the audi mold um and and does so i think by having that that kind of evil look to it and uh just absolutely gorgeous so it's entering kind of kind of a segment of one because there is another ultra high performance wagon on the market uh made by mercedes of course and that is the amg e63 s wagon uh, and it actually has a little more power than the, this new Audi. The, the AMG uh, E63 S wagon also uses a, a twin turbo 4.0 liter V8. So very similar uh, engine. Uh, and it produces 603 horsepower and 627 pound feet of torque. Um, can do zero to 60 in 3.4 seconds, uh, Mercedes claims. So these are very, very similar vehicles. But man, if you set them side by side, uh, the, the Mercedes doesn't hold a candle to, to the new RS6 in terms of looks. Um, also, Audi has the great, great Quattro history, so it's going to have a killer all-wheel drive system. Yeah, there's a part um, of me that hates to agree with you on that because I've been a, a Merc fan for years, especially when it comes to the wagons. And looking at these two side by side, God, I, I mean, the, the Mercedes still looks amazing. That E63, it just, it looks amazing. It's got the it does, it's lines, no slouch. But I'd, I'd have the Audi just based on the looks. And that's uh, that's kind of shaking me to my core right now because that's never happened. Ah, uh, that's <laughs> qu <laughs> that's questioning your, like, fanboyism. Personally, uh, I like the virtual cockpit a little bit more. I know it's kind of futuristic, but to analog gauges, for whatever reason to me, are starting to look old-fashioned. And on a brand new car, having that that fully digital gauge cluster and a cutting edge one at that, uh, it kind of puts the Audi over the top for me. Yeah, not only I, I actually agree with you. Not only are gauges feeling and becoming old fashioned to me as well, but I'm getting used to having access to so much more information at once. Um, and depending on the automaker, how they design the the kind of display of their all digital gauges, you know, some don't do it well, but the ones that do it well, you get so much more information than like two dials could give you. Audi is is industry leading in terms of the design of their digital displays. Uh, I mean, the current gen virtual cockpit is, you know, lauded by all of us as the, as the best uh, all digital display. So, and if you, if you watch the, the videos we've embedded of the Audi RS6 Avant's digital display, you can see it in action. And it's, it is a little bit futuristic because you don't, you know, it's not recreating a dial in digital. It's got like, you know, like kind of the uh, RPM, bent hockey stick gauge <laughs> that we used to see in the 80s but oh, it looks so cool the amg e63 s wagon starts at one hundred and eight thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars so a little under 110 so i'm i'm sure we'll see the audi start uh around the same price right um, i i before we jumped on the uh the podcast i looked up prices for the current rs6 across the pond and uh that's starting i think around eighty thousand pounds which translates to about ninety six thousand us so this this will almost certainly be over a hundred if not you know closer to the to the merc at 110 i would say yeah yeah and there's there's also uh you know we were looking for competitors and and we found a, a third one 
uh, or a second competitor for the Audi that that really isn't in the same class. It's it's less powered, but it's the Volvo V60 uh, T8 Polestar, um, and that uses a an actual a plug-in hybrid powertrain uh, that altogether generates 415 horsepower. Also has all-wheel drive. It's a little bit smaller of a wagon. Uh, it's more like a a mid-size uh, wagon compared to the kind of full-size wagons that the Audi and the Mercedes are. It's incredible that we still have performance wagons in this day and age. A Volvo deserves a, a hat tip because Volvo is definitely one of the few brands that have worked to keep wagons alive in the U.S. and has made some of the greatest wagons of all time. So they not only have the V, uh, the V60 and the V60 Polestar, they also have the V90, which is the much larger um, car. It'd be great. I, there isn't a V90 Polestar right now to compete with something like uh, the Audi RS6 Avant or the AMG E63 S wagon. But it'd be great if there were. <laughs> now, that, now that there's two of them, maybe Volvo will see a, a potential market and join in. But that really leads us to the bigger question, which is we're, we're going gaga over a wagon coming to the market. And that's because the U.S. has largely uh, fallen out of love with wagons. There, there was a time before minivans, before crossovers and SUVs where uh, wagons reigned supreme. I don't know. When would you say that was like the 70s was maybe the, the high watermark in terms of like probably overall sales from the 50s to the 19s to the mid 70s. Once you kind of get to the the oil embargo, I think it started to change at the late 70s. But certainly throughout the 50s and 60s, every mainline automaker you could think of offered multiple wagons, not just one. Right. Definitely through the 70s and into the early 80s, really the minivan is where the trend started to change because people still needed something that could haul the kids, the family, and had a little more space. They didn't necessarily want a full-size conversion van, although conversion vans back in the 70s and 80s were kind of trendy, almost like they're getting a little bit of a renaissance today. That's That'll be a different podcast. My family grew up and had two, two full-size, no, I'm sorry, three full-size conversion vans in a row. Awesome. And we, we loved those. But, uh, and then, then we got replaced with a the, with the minivan. Yep. Uh, but we never, we never had a wagon. Um, never had a wagon? Really? No, my family never did. Hmm. No, you guys were telling me that you both had a bunch of wagons growing up. And no, we never did. Uh, my parents had a, must have been an early 70s Chrysler town and country. I I only remember like one day we picked up a hitchhiker and it was it was really weird because I, I must have only been like like two or three. This was in the late seventies when we still had. That it. sounds safe. It, well, it's it, hey, it was it was a different time, <laughs> but I just remember this wagon being huge and it never it never ran worth a damn. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> did you, you guys ever ride? Or I guess I should ask Chris. Did you ever ride in like the very back jump seats of a wagon where you could like stare at uh, uh, the traffic coming up on you? Hell yes, I did. In fact, I later on, um, I actually bought a, a uh, 94 Buick Roadmaster okay. state that had the fold up seat in the back. So, I, I mean, that was I mean, that was sort of the wagon's last hurrah. Right. And yeah, uh, and yeah. I always love those cars. Yeah. Riding in the back. It's just it's kind of a weird feeling. But you know what? It, it was actually it was fairly comfortable. Yeah. So I only have one memory of that. And I we never had one like that, but I was in like preschool. And the one memory I have, there was this kid I was friends with and we were in the back of the very, very back of their wagon. And they, we had just gone swimming and there was like a bunch of like pool floats and stuff on the roof and they all slid off. And I just remember like yelling at the kid's mom to stop the car because <laughs> everything had slid off the roof. But yeah, it's useful to have kids facing backwards. Exactly. Yeah. So that's interesting. You guys had all of these growing up. So um, Smith, can you tell me tell me about some of the ones that you either had growing up or that you've owned uh, since you've become an adult? Well, I, I haven't owned any station wagons, John. Total lie. I've owned a lot of station wagons. <laughs> I was going to say, you're kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that Chrysler Town & Country. I really I remember the interior more than anything because I was just a very, very little kid at that point. I'm not that old. Um, but over the years, let's see, I had, uh, my first station wagon that I owned was a 1990 Subaru Legacy L. Uh, okay. Oh, all great, wheel, all great. wheel drive. Yeah. Rusty as can be. It was a Michigan car. I bought it for 800 bucks. It was a winter car. 
No kidding. Su- Subaru was another, uh, is another automaker that deserved credit for keeping the station wagon alive, going all the way back to, to what you're you're talking about, and even even farther back, uh, but still making station wagons today, and probably the most successful maker of station wagons today. Absolutely. I mean, that was my first wagon experience, and actually, that was also my first all-wheel drive experience. Um, the rear sh- uh, strut towers completely rotted out. I was out, I mean, like completely to the point where I was on a back road near Ann Arbor, um, trying to find a way home to, to avoid US 23. And I hit some potholes and all of a sudden I felt like the car was sitting a little bit lower. When I got home, the driver's side rear strut tower had completely broken away and the strut was shoved into the back seat and the back seat was holding it up. And I actually, I let it sit for a few weeks while I tried to figure out what to do. I found, I put a, a Craigslist ad for like just somebody that could do welding. And I found a guy in Ann Arbor that welded up like the most rigid cage you've ever seen for like 300 bucks. <laughs> That's <laughs> so, awesome. So it was like an awesome rally car at that point. What, uh, what came after that? Um, Wagon wise, let's see. Um, after that, I had an '87 Ford Taurus wagon. That was just another. I've had a lot of just cheap winter cars over the years, and uh, and that was another cheapy. It was really really rusty. When did I have that? Was that? a great wagon. I mean, the the Taurus itself was the first gen was great when it came out in the mid '80s because it looked so futuristic. It looked even more futuristic in wagon form because it was like a perfect kind of oval egg shape with that in that profile right i always think of christmas vacation where that's what they drive uh, (laughs) exactly with the with the wood grain sides i would pay serious money like maybe maybe five or six hundred bucks to buy a car like that i'm talking serious money here serious (laughs) five or six hundred yeah um slow down well that you know that's the thing that a lot of people today don't really understand back in the mid 80s right in the United States, cars were square. And I, when I say that, I mean that literally. They were square. The Caprices or the Crown Victorias, and they yeah, still had like, like sharp sharp edges. Like, like sharp edge square. And then here comes the Ford Taurus with its rounded styling. That looked totally futuristic to everybody back in the mid-80s. And then when the wagon came out, it's like, wow, they did a wagon too? Even the wagon looks futuristic. And I think that style is really held up well. And Yeah, I almost like the wagon better of that first year. Yeah, I, you know, I happened to get one of those. And then, you know, eventually, I've always dug the uh, the 94 to 96, uh, you know, Caprice, Impala, that whole line. And I managed to find uh, another inexpensive Roadmaster station wagon. It was, it was a 94 estate. Um, those are the big Berthas, right? I mean, those are like the land yachts. That was that was an eight passenger wagon. You could fit oh, you geez. could fit three people up front in the benches with three seat belts. You could fit three people in the back seat with three seat belts, and then it had the flip up seat like a like Bruce was talking about in the back with provisions for two more seat belts. And when you flip that seat up in the back, um, it had a fairly deep footwell. So you could actually sit there fairly comfortably. God, uh, how dangerous was must that have been? I mean, no fault to you, no one knew at the time probably, but put that in a modern crash test with eight crash dummy crash test dummies, and I bet the results would be absolutely frightening. You know, aside from just being surrounded by all of that glass, there was actually still a fair amount of room in the back. Um, I actually hauled in the back of that station wagon a full-size pool table. I, I took the legs off. Whoa. A full-size pool table. It's it was it's large enough to carry a 4 by 8 sheet of plywood. Yeah, I completely mm-hmm. believe that. So, it was amazing. And I know for a fact that it was very cool. This was back in 2013, I think I had that car. I bought it as a winter car uh, for a Mustang Cobra I had at the time. And the people that I was working with at the time... Uh, one of the ladies had a 16 year old daughter. I think that was just turning 16. She had seen the wagon in the parking lot at work one day. And this is a 94 Buick Roadmaster estate. It was the, uh, the medium blue with the fake wood grain sides, the whole oh shot. My God. She saw the wagon. Her daughter thought it was just the coolest thing ever for her 16th birthday. Her mom asked me, can I borrow the wagon? So, my daughter and her friends can go out and, you know, go to these different places in this old station wagon. So that is so strange. What a weird girl. There you go. (laughs) 16 year olds thought my Woody station wagon was awesome. Wait, can I ask if this was in Michigan or South Dakota? This was in Michigan. In Michigan. Okay. Well, I I don't know if I could get away with that in South Dakota, but 
seriously speaking, a lot of places have actually pegged those cars as as modern classics. Oh yeah, for, oh yeah, for I mean, sure. And prices are already going up on them. They are, they are. I've seen them online, pristine examples. Also, I mean, they had uh, engines that were, you know, obviously big V eight engines. Um, they're they're very easy to do engine swaps on. Um, so yeah, there's there's a whole market. Uh, for those uh, GM wagons now. Uh, what about you, Bruce? What either wagons did you grow up with or wagons have you owned that come to mind? So I've only actually owned one wagon and I still have it now. My wife and I have a 2012 Subaru Outback that we've had from new. Um, and it's been a perfect car for us. I mean, we only it's only us and a dog, but we do fairly because of family stuff. We do fairly frequent road trips around Ohio, kind of either to Cleveland or to Columbus or Zanesville or places like that. And I mean, it swallows all of our stuff fine. We've hauled TVs and stuff in it. It's it's perfectly good for that. But um, Smith talking about his uh, wood grain Buick, it reminded me. So when I was really little, like probably four or five, we had an AMC Eagle station wagon. Ooh. And I hope some of our listeners are familiar with those. In essence, it's the great, great grandson, or at least the progenitor of the Outback today. That's where the first it's crossover all real, too, right there. That's the first it, Maybe crossover. it's a crossover. Maybe it's a wagon. Yeah, it's yeah. For, but for those who aren't familiar, they offered them in multiple body styles. You could even get them in like a two or hatchback or just various things. But um, we had the wagon, and when we first got it, it I mean, it was you. This would have been in the very late eighties, very early nineties, and so it was probably an eight year old car at the time. But my dad hated the wood grain on it. And one of my mother's favorite stories is that he took an entire weekend with a heat gun, taking it to the because it was just, you know, a decal, essentially. Right. It was a real wood. taking the heat gun to the wood and peeling it all off the sides. So we had a, a D wood grained AMC Eagle wagon. That's funny to me, because like if you take that off, it's not like whatever's underneath. Has no, it's clear not. Coat he on just it. It's still, just like bare metal or like <laughs> He just hated the way it looked so much. And then the other the only other memory I have of it is that it didn't have air conditioning or if it did, it was broken. I'm not exactly sure which, but I just remember in the summer it was sweltering. Um, and we, I think we only had it for about a year or two, but those are my only two memories of it. But it, yeah, I see that, them rarely today, but they're very cool. I, I would I would agree with you that the Outback has to trace its lineage back to that AMC Eagle. And and the Outback, again, you already mentioned Subaru, but the, the Outback is, is super popular today mm -hmm. i would say of of it and i don't know the exact numbers but if you took the sales uh, total sales of all station wagons sold today i think the outback would probably be 75 percent of those sales like oh i would that sounds completely legitimate i mean i we look at subaru sale you know we look at all automaker sales every month as they come out but the outback is always at least number two if not number one for subaru sales it's it's one or the other every month. So yeah, they, they still move well and there's a new generation that's starting to hit dealers soon. So, and that's actually a good, a good segue because I've heard people, de people definitely compare the current Subaru ad back to other crossovers. Like it definitely competes with them, you know, uh, people would definitely cross shop an Outback with a, you know, I don't know, a Ford edge or, you know, picture sure. crossover of choice. What, I, what is the fascination with crossovers when you hold them up to uh, station wagons, uh, especially the Outback? Because the Outback basically is a station wagon and it is lifted and, and all wheel drive. So for, but it doesn't have the shape of an SUV. It's, 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 it's a station wagon shape. It's longer, thinner, um, whereas a crossover is a shape much more like a SUV or something like that. But I mean, when you think about it, isn't a crossover just a wagon that's a little higher and a little taller. Like they're so close in concept to me. Personally, I think it depends. To me, it has a lot to do with silhouette and proportions where to me, a wagon has significantly more room behind the rear seat. So if you look at it, there's that long expanse of glass and silhouette mm -hmm. versus a crossover that it can have a much more kind of five door hatchback just standard hatchback appearance where that kind of gets cut off but i'm curious to hear what smith has to think about uh 
the, uh, about this argument. Well, you know, I, I agree with you, except that I don't. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you make a good point there. The wagon has uh, that sort of that longer reach behind the uh, the rear seats, but that hasn't always been the case. I, I mean, you can still find wagons. I, I mean, I'm thinking of like the uh, you know the the 2002 WRX wagon when that came out, um, and, and the Cadillac the CTS of, wagon. Yeah, you, oh, you know, you know, one. leading up there where you know there's not a lot of space back there. For me, the the difference really is more. The wagon's going to have sort of a of a car profile. It might sit a little bit lower, but I mean, let, let's be realistic here. Wagons fell out of style because they were big, they were heavy, they had this ridiculous looking wood grain. They were very uncool, and that's really what it what it came down to. They were oh, being always, uncool is definitely what did it. Yeah, they were. I mean, they were always great machines. They were always practical. They could always do far yeah, more but, than people realize. But now crossovers. People are going to crossovers because they're kind of more like wagons than SUVs, you know? And and there's even a question, okay, is, is SUV now getting a little too cliched? So now we'll go to crossover. Well, what's a crossover doing? Crossover is shrinking down in some areas. It's it's taking more of a car shape. It's becoming a station wagon. So in 10 years, will crossovers just basically be station wagons as we know them or as we used to know them, you know? I mean, I, t- t- I, I think... If you look at the history, station wagons were displaced by minivans. Um, and we'd have to ask, why was that? Were minivans? It definitely, I think, uh, station wagons lost any sense of cool that they had. They were they became bloated fa- the family vehicles. And, and I think, like we all see, people want to move away from being seen as driving a boring family vehicle. Now, I don't think I was old enough in the 80s when minivan popularity started to know if people thought minivans were cool. But for whatever reason, they started buying them in droves instead of um, instead of wagons. And then at some point, the same thing happened to minivans, where now all of a sudden they're totally uncool, but SUVs are cool. Um, and we went along with that for a while. And SUVs are cool because they don't look like family vehicles. They look like adventure vehicles. Uh, but then the crossover came along and had advantages over the SUV and, you know, so now crossovers are, are seen as cool. So for me, all of this seems propelled by, by parents who want to be driving something that doesn't look like they have kids. Yes. (laughs) Like, like it's (laughs) them trying to avoid the image of being an actual family, which is what they are. But I agree 100%. That, that's a very astute observation. And, uh, uh, you, you know, maybe maybe it's it's a reason why wagons are still fairly popular across the pond. I, I mean, what we're talking about here is really U.S. trends. You go to Europe and, uh, and, and over into Asia, you s- still see a lot of station wagons offered. In the United States, th- th- that's very interesting, John. There's almost it's almost like it's a stigma. I don't want people to see that I actually have a family. I want people to think that I'm this adventurer. So instead of a station wagon, I'm going to have an SUV that sits up a little bit higher with a little with larger tires uh, because I go where there aren't any roads. And I guess by oh, that, it's all by, about marketing. Yeah, it's I, all about advertising yeah. and marketing and convincing people. The thing we were driving five years ago is ugly. You should drive this new thing, a little bit more expensive, but it's it'll make you cooler. Right. I mean, here we're so susceptible to marketing. Plus, we don't have like um, the the pressure of the cost of fuel to keep our cars a certain size. So our cars have gotten larger and larger over time. And I think that culminated in the Ford Excursion, uh, like 42 passenger SUV, however many uh, people that held. Um, that was kind of the, like the, the the gross end of the of the spectrum. But in Europe, they always had the constraint of fuel prices and smaller roads and, and things like that, which I think worked in favor of the wagon as opposed to, you know, I, I think it kind of stunted the growth and popularity of the SUV over there a little bit. I mean, SUVs and, and crossovers have still gotten crazy popular over there, too. But I think in in slightly smaller numbers and in smaller sizes, too, like you're not going to find um, expedition sized SUVs over in over in Europe, usually. And, you know, as we see uh, crossover trends continue, I really wouldn't be surprised to see crossovers in the next 10 years or so evolve to where they kind of become traditional station wagons again. Maybe they continue to sit up a little bit higher, right? 
I could wonder if older station wagons don't gain popularity, especially amongst, you know, someone who's in their late 30s, 40s, wants to kind of have something fun but still wants to carry the family and maybe you know as opposed to the the 42 year old guy buying a used corvette what if he buys you know a used mercedes wagon a used volvo 240 and still has something that can be fun but also is a little bit more practical i I definitely think in the in the 90s the 2000s there were some really great high performance wagons that are now much more affordable um, that, that could fit the profile of what you're saying. Uh, but I, I kind of agree with, with Smith in that I think there has been such a softening of crossovers that some of the ones coming out to me are getting dangerously close to just being either wagons or five door hatchbacks. And I'll give you an example, the 2020, uh, Ford escape, the, the, it is so slick and smooth and kind of non-masculine, non-SUV, that to me, it looks like either a wagon or, or a five-door hatchback that's only slightly lifted. Like, it it barely qualifies visually for me as a crossover SUV. I agree. I, I, I also agree. agree. Yeah, so, so we'll see. I don't know if that means they'll ever morph back into the station wagon profile we were talking about where you kind of have that longer glass behind uh, the C pillar. But I think there's definitely a branch of crossovers that are not going the SUV route by be, trying to be as butch and ad- adventure looking as possible, like a RAV4, but that are going the the slicker, more more car route. And I'd put the the Mazda um, crossovers in that camp too. The CX-5, the CX-9. The CX-9 is just a big station wagon. It really is. It has like zero uh, uh, ground clearance. It is. It is just a giant station wagon. Bring it full circle. Look at the new R- RS6. <laughs> that thing, that thing just looks, I, I mean, it wants to eat your lunch. It wants to beat you up and eat your lunch. And it's a station wagon. There's, there's, there's nothing that's a, uh, that's subtle or even family oriented about that, except that it has four doors and a lot of glass. Oh no. Right. Right. So, um, I think we're all in agreement that the, uh, new Audi RS6 Avant will be an instant classic. Uh, but I, I want to go around the table and list a few of our favorite station wagons from all time. See what we come up with. So, uh, Bruce, how about you start? I got to talk about the Volvo 240. Uh, my dad had one about five years ago. I want to say it was in 87 or 88. It's after they went away from the seal beam headlights. So it had kind of the more aerodynamic headlights on it. Um, and it's probably the slowest car I've ever driven. And it's probably also the most enjoyable, or at least one of the most enjoyable. And note I didn't say fun, because it's built like a tank, A. There's so much room behind you that it feels like you could just load it with whatever you want. And it's also just kind of cushy and comfortable that you just kind of go down the road and you feel like you're driving a brick. And it's a car without any sort of pretension about itself. And I loved it. It it was just fantastic. And I don't know why he got rid of it. But. Those Volvo, I, I, I fully regret not ever having driven one yet. I hope to, you know, resolve that because I've, I look at those, uh, Volvo wagons from the eighties and they are the epitome of just the box wagon I yeah. mean, slab sided. Uh, like you said, no pretension. They are built like tanks. You will find ones with 350,000 miles on them for sale online for prices that just seem way higher than any vehicle with 350,000 miles uh, should be priced at. And people will leave comments like, oh, this is a baby. This is, you know, (laughs) this has another 400,000 miles to go. So the other one I want to mention is also a Volvo, but it is a much newer Volvo. So the previous generation V60 Polestar, um, they were brought to this country in very, very limited numbers, um, which makes it cool anyway. But then they have a 300 and what, 62 horsepower turbocharged four cylinder. So it's this kind of compact wagon that also has a ton of horsepower. I want to drive one someday. I've now, someone here in town has the sedan version, the S60. I've never actually seen the wagon in the flesh other than pictures, but that just screams cool to me. Did they sell that car in any other color than the, the Polestar Blue? 
I think the second batch they brought in, you might have been able to get white and red for some reason. But I know the first batches were all Polestar blue. Yeah, I've only ever seen them blue. Yeah, all right, what's your what's your uh, third one? I really, really, really want the new Audi RS6, and I love that it exists, and it's immediately one of my favorite wagons. And it also really endears me to Audi in a certain way because it is an awful business decision to bring it here. <laughs> they are not going to sell any. No. You, 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 they're, they're just not, not in going high to, numbers. I mean, they're, well, they're going to sure. bring okay. over. I don't mean that in a literal have, sense. But, You're right. right. But they are not going to sell very many of those here because most people are going to end up getting a crossover. You know, they're going to get a Q7, a Q3. You know, they're going to get one of those models and more power to them. Those are fine cars. But what Audi has done is that they've made sure that people will talk by bringing it here. Finally, they've made sure that people will be talking about it for years, no matter how long they sell it here, because every time there's a list of the coolest cars that aren't crossovers that you can haul your family with, someone's going to mention the RS6. As soon as people mention it, it's just going to end up it's going to come up in conversation. It's going to end up on one of those like classic, you know, in 10 years cars that you should be like looking out for. It's just really smart and it's really cool and it looks awesome and it makes me happy. Yeah. I think it's a better marketing decision than buying a Super Bowl ad. Like it, <laughs> in it'll a certain pay, way it'll it pay is for itself over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. So who, who I think those thought, are my three. Who would have thought that a, a Halo car could be a wagon? That's really what we're talking about, though. Sure. I think that's kind extraordinary. Of, yeah. yeah. Because the I don't R8 know we, technically exists, but you know, no one's really talking about them anymore. And well, this, that's what I was going to say. Like The R8 does exist, but this might, uh, aside from that, this might be their, um, yeah, their Halo car. Uh, what about you, Smith? Uh, what's on your list? Oh, so many. Um, you know, <laughs> keep, it's like, keep it to three. Where, where, where do I start? I'll throw a quick mention out to the first gen Legacy Turbo. That was awesome. Um, that that can't make my list though. Um, I'll narrow it down here to the early seventies, late sixties, early seventies, with the Buick Sport Wagon, the Olds Vista Cruiser. If you Google those up, um, you'll see back in the day those cars were cool because they didn't just have a flat roof they had kind of like a bubble roof with a glass up there between i mean they were sister cars the same the same platform just with some different styling cues um i tend to favor the buick um and it's not because i had a buick roadmaster uh, a 94 roadmaster although I, I guess it could be partly because of that because that's also on my favorite list that 94 to 96 uh b body i prefer the roadmaster over um the caprice wagon and uh, and i think oldsmobile also had a wagon at that point still too i mean those are going to be future classics no doubt they're already going there they had the um the the slightly detuned LT1 V8 that was in the Corvette. It was 300 horse in the Corvette, 275 in the Camaro, and then it was 260 in the in the uh, in the wagon. And that was still enough. And the wagons usually got the uh, the towing package where they had the the tighter rear end ratio. I, completely. That's why they're going to be future classes. Yeah, I, the, I mean, you know, basically Corvette powered wagon. Completely stock. And paying three thousand dollars for a less than a, less than attractive version, I still had no problems just completely smoking the tires on that car. It was just an absolute blast to drive. Um, my third choice, and John, I know you're probably just just eager, eager, eager for me to talk about this one. I am. Um, <laughs> I can hear it in your voice. He's like salivating. Um, I'm rocking back and forth. So just to give you a visual. So. Um, just a little bit of history. I've owned a lot of Taurus shows over the years. I'm a big Taurus show fan, and I know, John, you are too. Um, and I've had a liking of the Ford Taurus wagon body style. A few years ago, I had the chance to buy a 1987 Mercury Sable LS station wagon that had a Taurus show V6 five-speed manual swap done. And it, it came up, a friend of mine had it. He bought it from a... Ford, a mid-level Ford engineer that actually built this car back in, uh, it was the early 90s, right back when the show was just starting out. He bought a wrecked 89 Taurus show, and he got the engine, the drivetrain, and the interior from that. And then he bought um, the, this Mercury Sable. I think he bought it in 1990, so it was it was three years old when he bought it. 
he did the conversion. He was a he was a Ford engineer, so when I bought the car, it had probably a three inch stack of paperwork where he went to like Fairlane Ford right there in Dearborn. He sourced all Ford parts to do the conversion. Um, there were, I think, two or three custom components that he, he had to make under the hood. I always felt if Ford actually built a five-speed show wagon, that first generation, it would have been like that. And um, it's it's. I sold it a few years ago. I'm still in contact with a guy. I know John, you're in contact with him too. You and I, <laughs> you and I might have a gladiatorial phase off one day to buy it back. But that car with the with the five-speed manual. With that engine under the hood, um, I mean, it was a total sleeper. It had good looks. It had good styling. That that's that's one I'll have back one of these days. Oh, an amazing car! Uh, yeah, I would I would happily buy it next. Or you know, I'm not going to fight you for it. You you would be a great uh, custodian of it as well. I just want to see it live forever. <laughs> oh, f- oh, fight uh, fight you- me for it because I already have too many cars. And uh, okay, and, and <laughs> you'll you'll win. I'm 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 very weak. I'm a very weak person. It also it also had the the sable light bar too up front, which is awesome. It had, and I tell you what, man, uh, for any sable or Ford people out there, if you have an eighty six to eighty eight Mercury sable front light bar, that is unobtainium, man. You cannot yeah, find really? those. I didn't know anywhere. they were that rare. Um, they they weren't rare back in the day, but finding one now that isn't yellowed the only option you really have is is to try to find you know like a new old stock nobody no aftermarket companies i think are making those and uh that original light bar was 80 86 when the car came out through 88 89 it changed style slightly because the when i got the wagon the 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 light bar was a little yellowed and i thought well i'll just replace that and then i was like oh yeah, I guess I'm not. <laughs> not that easy. I, I found one on eBay like uh, about a year or so after I had it because I still had visions of fixing it. I don't know why. It's like I sold the car, but uh, I found one on eBay. It was like, I think it was up to like 150 bucks and I thought about bidding on it. But uh, I told the guy that bought it, you know, there was, hey, there's one on eBay if you want to get it. I had actually painted the light bar and I did a little custom thing on it. So it looked pretty good. But yeah, that's that's my wagon experience. Uh, yeah, I, I, it, it, I had, like I said before, I've never owned a wagon, didn't have them growing up. I want that wagon to be my first wagon experience. So I'm just, just waiting for this current owner to be done with it. And, and then you and I will fight. I will be victorious and <laughs> park it in my garage, but you can visit it anytime or I'll just drive it to South Dakota and visit. Well, that's extraordinarily generous. Yeah. Um, all right. So let me, let me do my three. Um, I'm going to start with a Volvo as well. Um, I'm I'm going with the mid '90s uh, Volvo 850R wagon. Uh, this was a, a a to me a great time for Volvo because in terms of design, it was like the midpoint between Volvos being incredibly boxy of you know like the 80s and the volvos we kind of know today that are extremely sexy with with incredible design uh this was like in the middle they were still boxy but they were just starting to get get a little softer on the edges and have this really cool look uh but the 850 wagon was uh you know very slab sided in the back um kind of like the the mid 80s uh volvo wagon you were talking about bruce um, and then they sold the R version, uh, and that had a 220 horsepower five cylinder turbo, which was an engine the Volvo used in a lot of things back then. There was even a special version sold in, I think, 95 called the T5R that had 240 horsepower. And they raced these. I mean, you could see, you could catch these on track. They were notorious for torque steer. I kind of love I kind of love 90s torque steer cars. A lot of Sobs had that uh, affliction, but it, it was definitely <laughs> fun to slam on the uh, the gas and and grip the wheel as tight as you can while it tried to go every which way but straight. My second choice is kind of going to be similar to your uh, show Sable Wagon. Uh, it is going to be a show wagon, but it's going to be a, a very special one that I remember Car and Driver built. Car and Driver, and it was a se- it was from a second gen Taurus, a red one, and it was a cover car in, in I think ninety three. And the article had something to do with Billy the Kid. I remember, like they traced a route Billy the Kid you know, traveled, uh, with it. They worked with Ford to build it and it was just, it was perfect. It was, it was exactly how you would imagine a show wagon to be. Um, and it was somehow faster even than the sedan. 
Uh, and I think they they said it had something to do with the weight over the back and it evened out the weight distribution better. Um, it, it was just, I was reading every single car magazine back then. I still have that issue. I, as a matter of fact, I think I have two or three copies. And it's just, it's one of my favorite car magazines of all time. One of my favorite issues. One of my favorite cars of all time. I heard it's, I don't know if it's destroyed. It, it, uh, it is. I um, It is? Huh. I actually had the chance to ride in that car several years ago. Oh, you're kidding um, me. Back when I was doing tour show club stuff in Southwest Michigan. Um, How did it get destroyed then in, in recent history? It, you know, I don't know exactly the the reason behind it being destroyed. Um, the people that I knew at the time, um, it was still in use over at Ford, it had been repainted white at that point. And, and I don't know why it was repainted white, but this must have been back in 2001 or 2002. Um, 2002, actually, because Ford brought over their new, uh, their Terminator Cobra for our, we had a small convention, a little show that we were doing. And they brought that over. They brought the, the, the show wagon over. The, they managed to track it down. But I don't know what happened to it after that, other than I was talking to some people a few years later and they said, yeah, it, uh, it finally went to the crusher. I don't know if they pulled, I don't know if they pulled the engine out of it. Uh, I mean, it was, it was the 3.2 liter with the automatic and I mean, yeah, it was, it was beautifully set up to be, you know, your fast, your fast wagon family vehicle. That, that should have gotten a ground up restoration, not gone to the crusher. Yeah. That's, that's too bad. Um, all right. Well, that definitely put a dour mood on my second I'm choice. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> all right. My third choice, though. Uh, well, it's, it's also my third choice has also been killed off, and it's the Dodge Magnum SRT8. Uh, and really, the Dog, Dodge Magnum in general. Most station wagons are a version of a sedan, right? It's like they launch the sedan and then they launch the wagon version. You could argue that the Magnum is the wagon version of the Charger, but it's not really. It had different bodywork. It was kind of its own standalone wagon, which is is pretty rare. Not unheard of, but but pretty rare. Also, for being a vehicle sold in the late 2000s, it was, uh, with the SRT8 model, a full-on V8-powered performance wagon. You know, I mean, I, I, wagons got rare enough, but V8-powered wagons after, like, the Roadmaster and the Caprice you were talking about got super rare. So the fact that uh, the Magnum exists uh, existed is awesome. Um, I think it definitely, uh, carried the torch, helped pass it along of performance wagons, uh, all the way up to the one we're talking about today from Audi, you know, through the, the Cadillac CTS V wagon, you know, all of these great high performance wagons. Uh, the Magnum was a really unique one. And I think a lot of people are sorry that it didn't survive, even though the charger and the challenger kept going, it was kind of the 300 and the 300. Yeah. Thank you. It's the one that kind of got its wings clipped, uh, too early. And did you Um, know in Europe, there was a 300 wagon that they sold? Yes. They might, do they still sell it? No, oh, I don't know. I, I don't know. That I don't know, but I know it was sold there. They do sell a 300 uh, uh, SRT8 still in Europe right now. I don't think they do the wagon, but you're right. There was a 300 wagon that was had the 300's face and the and the Magnum's uh, body. I had, a tr- I had trouble picking three. I mean, when you really start looking, you just fall into this pool of really great wagon choices. Honorable mention was the Saab Turbo X Combi. Mm-hmm. Remember that? Oh, yep. Yeah. All black, totally sinister looking. And it was that limited edition Turbo X model uh, that they made a wagon version of for a little while. So, yeah, I could I could probably name three more off the top of my head. But we'd love to hear what all of you think. Get your comments on this on the podcast post that we publish on MotorOne.com. Or you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at, at MotorOne.com where we'll continue the discussion as well. If you've been listening to us on the website, you can also find us on iTunes and Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts and Spotify. We actually had an issue with our feed on Spotify, but it should be fixed now. Go ahead and subscribe to us so that you don't miss out on any any episodes. And we'll come back from the break and talk about what we're driving this week. Welcome back. Uh, during this part of the show, we talk about what cars we're driving this week. And today, let's start with you, Smith. What have you been driving this week? Well, actually, let's uh, talk a little bit about what I didn't drive this week, just because it's an inter- interesting story uh, for those that have been listening. Thinking about replacing my 2004 Mazda 6 S five-door hatchback with something new and similar. And the Buick Regal uh, Sportback was on my list. It's a little bit higher in price that I want to pay for a new car, but I thought I would give it a shot. 
And uh, so, and this is kind of a sign of the times. I called up the local Buick dealer and said, yeah, I'd like to come in, take a look at a Regal Sportback and uh, take it for a drive, see how it feels. And there was a pause. And there was a longer pause. And I heard, I heard some, you know, some keyboard rattling. And he said, uh, I'm sorry, what were, you, what were you looking for again? The salesman at the Buick dealer didn't know what a Regal Sportback was. Wow. <laughs> and uh, and uh, then he recovered pretty quick. He's like, oh, okay, okay, yeah, I know what you're talking about. The 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 weird the weird Buick with a hatch. Yeah, okay. Oh, my God. This is the weird Buick. Keep, keep in mind, this. I'm sure this isn't, isn't uh, definitive for all Buick dealerships around the country. I'm in Rapid City, South Dakota, where, I mean, this is... Truckville. The, in fact, one of the dealerships used to be called just like Truck Town. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, a lot of trucks out here, a lot of SUVs. And in fact, the the salesman. I mean, and he was he was super kind, super polite, super awesome. He even said, "Yeah, man. I mean, we just." We sell encores like crazy. We we sell encores like crazy. They did have a, yeah. they did have a Buick Regal GS that was sitting in the showroom. So I mean, I went in and took a look, and I mean, I think that's a really gorgeous car. I think that's a that's a car that doesn't get enough recognition. It's got good performance. He offered to let me take it out for a drive, and I was like, man, I mean, it's forty grand. I'll be honest, I'm I'm not anywhere near interested in going that high for a car. But if you get a regular yeah. sport back, let me know. I'd like to see how it how it goes. So that's sort of my what I didn't drive this week. Although, as we're talking about wagons, they did have a Regal Tour uh, Tour X sitting out there. Oh, that's cool. And, I've heard a lot of good and, things and, about the Tour And X. now with all this wagon talk, it's like, well, you know, I don't really need a wagon for a regular car, but damn wouldn't hurt i gotta say i drove one of those last year you can find it uh if you look up our oregon trail drive because the drive went oh that's right it followed the oregon trail it was really a nice little car honestly it it um my dad and i went on the drive together and it swallowed both of our luggage absolutely no problem and it was nice and it was plenty quick enough like it if it's worth taking a look at because they're pretty nice i mean aside from not sitting up a little bit higher. I mean, uh, the Regal, when you open up that rear hatch, lots of space inside. I mean, it, it's comparable, if not a little bit more than I would find, in, I think, in the 6. I would need to look up the, the specific stats on that, but I was impressed with that. Um, you, you know, the interior felt nice. Obviously, I have no driving impressions. And I said, if you if you ever get one back in, and he even, you know, he even kind of admitted to, uh, I mean, we just we get these and they just don't sell. I mean, I think that, I think that Regal GS has been there a long time. I could probably get a hell of a deal on it, but it's, I mean, they would have to come way, way down. I, I'm not interested in spending that Well, the much. Regal, the, the Regal Sportback that they didn't have there for you to look at starts at 25,000. Yeah. So, I mean, that's totally like the price ranges you were talking yeah, about. Yeah. Right? That's, 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 I mean, that's, that's right there. The, the Regal GS gets up just about 40 grand though. And that's honestly, if, if I'm going to pay 40 grand, there I, I would I would probably look at other options. So I'll go next. I'll I have been driving this week a uh, 2019 Jeep Renegade Limited 4x4, which is a subcompact SUV uh, from Jeep. Um, it's a limited model, so it's not the Trackhawk that you know is you know has the special all-wheel drive system and is trail rated and all that. Uh, but it is uh, the price is a little shocking. It's a subcompact SUV. It is not fully loaded. There are like two trims above the limited, but the prices out the door is $34,860, which shocked me because we just did a, an article on the, the 2020 Ford Escape, and the most expensive one is a bit under 40 which doesn't surprise me, but to have a vehicle that's uh, smaller... Um, that's not even loaded to be at 35,000 seems uh, very expensive to me. However, price aside, I really like the Renegade. I think it has really great looks, a real unique kind of Jeep look. I think we, we talked an episode or two ago about how the Jeep Compass and the Jeep uh, Cherokee have really morphed into almost looking like the exact same vehicle. The Renegade, though, really stands apart. It's got this like really tall, slab-sided kind of look to it um, that's all its own. And when you sit inside it, the, the windows are, are upright and they're far away from you. So it really feels like you've just got tons and tons of space inside and you've got all this light coming in. It's a really cool driving experience because of that. Um, I mean, the driving experience otherwise isn't anything remarkable. It drives fine. Um, it's got enough power and all of that. But 
Um, you know, you throw in the 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 Chrysler uh, UConnect navigation system, which is really nice, and and it's a really really good drive. Um, you know, I don't think I'd pay MSRP for it, but uh, if there were some good deals that made it uh, made its price more competitive, um, it would definitely be near near the top for me if I were shopping for subcompact SUVs. I really I really dig it. You know that uh, it makes me think because the Renegade is should be the vehicle that matches up against the baby Bronco that we've been uh, that we've been covering because th- that's going to ride on the Escape platform. And you know, I'm wondering if if it's going to match better in price to that uh, that Escape based baby Bronco or Adventure well, a, or Scout or whatever it's whatever it's called a Renegade Trackhawk or a Renegade uh, Trailhawk versus a uh, Ford baby Bronco would be a great comparison. Yeah, it, it, yeah, can't wait to see that. I was going to ask. So you're kind of a fan of the five the Fiat 500 X too, aren't you, John? No, not the X. Oh. Uh, common misconception. <laughs> uh, I'm a fan of the more hated and loathed 500L. I'm not a fan of the X, actually. but Because okay. I was going to ask how they compare, but okay. You know, no, it's it's interesting that you brought that up because the Renegade and the 500X share the exact same platform, and I've driven both. And the 500X, and mind you, I, I haven't driven a 500X in probably three years, but when I did drive one, it was it was not long after I'd also driven a Renegade, and the 500X tries to be a sporty uh, subcompact crossover, but it goes too far into the territory of having a just having a stiff suspension. It doesn't the stiff suspension doesn't make it feel like it handles better. It just rides terribly. Um, that's what I remember about the 500X, and the the Renegade isn't like that at all. The Renegade rides very comfortably, but it, you know the suspension is still firm enough to feel like it's in control and stable. So that it, it's a it's a very good balance. But no, the 500X, uh, also the 500X is is much smaller on the outside and wraps around you much tighter. The Renegade, like I said, is completely different. It's the windows are far away from you. They're upright, so much air and light. Really, one of the reasons I like the 500L actually is is the same reasons. Um, but yeah, so yeah, I, I spent, no, I, would, I spent a week with a 500 X, uh, it was probably about two or three years ago. I kind of agree with you, John. I don't know that, um, I didn't really hate the ride quality that much. I, I did, I did find it was just, it was just really cramped inside for trying to be a little, um, a little compact SUV. I thought it was, I thought it was actually kind of fun to just kind of romp on the gas and just let it zing itself out though. I would say it's a, it's an attractive design. I mean, um, I, I like a lot of the Fiat designs, and and that's one of the more attractive ones. Um, oh, one thing about the Renegade that is pretty neat is the the roof is the dual pane panoramic power sunroof. It is all glass. Every square inch of the roof is glass, uh, and there is a cover that you you know that you can electronically deploy to cover it in case the sun's like beating down on you. But um, it's an impressive experience to open that up and just, I mean, it almost feels like you're in a convertible, which you hate. Our, which I hate, but not not if not if there's actual glass separating me from the outside. Oh of the yeah, that's that's great. Jagged pieces of glass can sever your head much quicker. Well, I'm not assuming I'm going to get into an accident, <laughs> but better. I, I mean, I don't like convertibles. I don't like the wind in my hair. I don't like people like hearing what I'm listening to. I don't like any of that. I like my privacy and my you know. So if if I could have a convertible with just like a bubble uh, window top, that would be fine. All right. Well, I want to thank you guys for being on the episode with me today. Yeah, no problem. Always happy to be here. Same here. Great. And I want to thank everybody out there for listening. Uh, Make sure you come back next week when we'll have an all new episode. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.